Hey everybody, thank you for downloading the Closing Kit Masterclass Tactics Proven to Close. The goal of this masterclass is to give you the skills to win every possible deal by mastering the buying cycle. There's one key reason why deals die or slip, and we'll get into that shortly. This course is designed to arm you with the skills to handle any buying cycle, any objection, and make sure that you can close on time and consistently. Now, there's only one thing missing from today's session, and that's gonna be pricing and negotiation. As you can imagine, a lot goes into that. It's gonna take much more than uh, the time we have for today. So keep an eye out for the next masterclass, which is all we're gonna focus on, is how to win the negotiation. All right, before we dive into it, thought I'd tell you a little bit about me. My name is Devin Reed. I am the content strategy manager here at gong.io. A little bit on my background, I've spent six years in SaaS sales. About two years ago, I was hired here at Gong as the second sales hire. Uh, and then I eventually helped build and scale the mid-market playbook about a year later. And then now I currently manage Gong's sales content, assets just like today's masterclass, and brand awareness, in case you've seen me around LinkedIn or industry events. Now, into what we're gonna to cover today. It is threefold. The first one is why it's critical to avoid the pricing conversation via email. Next is how to overcome deal killers in the buying process. And lastly, control your deal with a mutual action plan or a map. All right, let's just dive right into it here. Now, when to use the closing kit is pretty important. It will vary a little bit depending on your, like who you sell to, how you sell your sales process. But essentially you should be thinking about this once the prospect has communicated that they're going to make a purchase of some sort. Maybe they tell you they're buying yours specifically. Maybe they said, hey, we're definitely buying something like your offering, but we're you know, a competitor still in play. This is a great time to make sure that you have these assets on hand. And as we go through them, you'll see a couple of them actually start before the closing motion, but they become very um, important once you're really in that buying cycle. And so the first one is it's okay to share pricing via email. It is not smart to negotiate pricing over email. Anyone that's been in the sales game knows that you know almost every single sales leader will beat you over the head and say, never negotiate over email. We're gonna get into why here. Now, if you're negotiating over email, you have a few disadvantages and you're pretty much just shooting yourself right in the foot. And we're gonna cover what those look like. The key is that you want to get the conversation to phone or voice because that's where you have the upper hand, that's where the playing field's more even, and that's where you can win. And so when you negotiate price over email, you introduce the risk of miscommunication. A really big one is that it's much tougher to understand someone's tone via text, you know, written out, versus if you can hear me like you can right now. You can hear my inflection, you can hear my tone, you know how the words are coming across, versus when they're written down, you can lose a lot of that. Maybe you come across as too aggressive or maybe too soft in your ask, and so they take advantage of that. The next one is that they have infinite time to respond to you. If we're in a live conversation, you have what, half a second to five seconds on a long pause to get back to me. But if I send you an offer and it takes you, you know, two days to read that email, then once they read that email, they decide, hey, maybe this isn't important, or they just wanna take the time to craft the perfect response and rebuttal to you, that's gonna lead to number three, which drags out the sales cycle. So you've lost some of your upper hand there, and then it's also gonna take a lot longer. You can knock out most pricing and negotiations in you know, a single 10 to 30 minute call. Sometimes it takes like, you know, a follow-up meeting. But if you're doing it over email, it can take hours or days or in worse scenarios, even weeks. And so that's how you're losing power behind the screen. You're losing tone, you're losing time, you're giving up your leverage, and you're missing a lot of information outside of the words that are being said when you're just relying on the text. And then lastly, it's much easier for someone to say no to you over email, right? You kind of think back to like cold calling. 
which is, you know, you reach out via email, they can say no really easily. They can ignore you, delete you. If you catch them on the phone, you at least have a shot if they say no to rebuttal, right? So kind of keep that mind frame uh, in terms of why it's so much more impactful to do it over the phone. And so what we're gonna cover is, you know, I know we're gonna cover negotiation and what that conversation looks like on the next masterclass, but in the meantime, I wanted to save you from falling into that trap. And so the first tip here is to just keep it very simple and assume the conversation will occur over the phone. So again, I'm okay with, you know, removing the friction uh, in the buying cycle and experience. And if my prospect says, hey, Devin, uh, you know, maybe it's after a demo call and they email me and say, hey, Devin, you know, we forgot to talk about price. Can you send me over your pricing model? I'm 100% okay with that. I know sometimes, you know, people don't even want to do that or, you know, because on their website, maybe pricing isn't explicit and they're hiding it, you know, purposefully. So you reach out. There's a lot of different reasons why, but ultimately I think that it's okay to share your pricing model. And if you want to do the math for them and do like a really light quote, that's up to you. I think that's okay. I don't think that's going to kill the deal by any means, but you should be mindful that what that's going to probably lead to is an ask. Maybe not immediately, maybe later, but just know once you've shared the pricing model, they might come back and say, you know, hey, Devin, it looks like, you know, 30 licenses is going to cost me $40,000. Can we do it for $30,000? That is the beginning of the negotiation. And that's where you need to stop and implement some of these tips to make sure you uh, migrate that conversation over to phone where you can win. And so once they've made that ask, any ask of terms or price, this is how I would respond. Hi, Jenna, happy to connect and chat through pricing levers with you. How's your schedule look for day and time? Really light, either a light mood or you know a neutral tone, if anything, which is the goal. And it's just, again, I'm assuming we're doing this over phone. It's not even a question. Now, if they object, what you're gonna wanna do is explain why it's in their best interest to discuss over the phone. They might say, you know, hey, Devin, I just don't have time today. I'm slammed, but I need to submit pricing. Or they might just want to play hardball and be like, no, I don't, I don't want to meet. Just, just send it over. So that's where you flip it a little bit. You're going to add a little more to this and say, hi, Jenna, totally makes sense, right? We're going to say whatever that objection is, we understand. But there are a couple of factors in play, and I want to ensure the quote addresses everything you're looking for and fits within your budget. There's that hint at negotiating. Plus, I want to be available for any follow-up questions you might have. I'm sure we can knock it out in a 10-minute call. How's, day, how's Tuesday afternoon look on your end? So again, we're just assuming that it's going to happen over phone, but you're going to kind of guide them and say, hey, it's actually in your best interest. I want to make sure that I'm doing right by you. Okay. Earlier, I teased what the biggest reason why deals die or slip, and that's misalignment on the buying process. And this can take shape in a couple of different ways. One, which I think is very common, is sales reps are going through their sales funnel. They go from discovery and then their demo, maybe a second demo, they've talked about price, and then they really start to go for the close. And their prospect says, you know, whoa, 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 we're not, we're not ready yet. We're not ready to negotiate. We're not ready to talk implementation. And that can leave you scratching your head. You've gone through your sales funnel. You're not really sure what's going on. It causes confusion. And that's because you're in two different places in the evaluation process. So you want to avoid that and make sure we're in tandem the entire sales process. The other one could be that they're new to buying something at their organization, or they don't fully understand all of the steps in the buying process for them. And that can mislead you. And so we're going to want to uncover all of the unknowns. The goal is to understand what those unknowns or those landmines are so you can navigate the deal with an upper hand. You don't wanna go 50 miles an hour and then see a speed bump five feet ahead of you, right? You wanna know everything that's coming your way so you can handle it tactfully. And what this green light checklist is that we're gonna get into in a second is it has a couple great uh, benefits. So one, you're gonna uncover all the steps in the buying process identifying necessary stakeholders, looping in everyone that has a, a touch on this decision, and then you're gonna confirm that buying process from beginning to end. This will help you increase your close rates, 
because you won't get hit with unknowns. You'll shorten your sales cycle because you understand everything that needs to happen. You can get it done quickly. And then you're going to be a more consistent sales professional because you're going to know when deals are coming in. So here's what the green light checklist looks like. Now this is going to be customized based on your uh, selling motion, who you sell to, how you sell, but this will be a very good starting place for you. On the left hand side, I have the four major pillars that need to be handled price, budget, legal, and security review. For more complex and enterprise sales, contact me after. I, I can give you some tips on a couple more sections to add, but I wanted to keep it somewhere in the middle ground where everyone can relate to and this would be helpful. At the top, you're going to see four different pillars the prospect point of contact, who are we talking to to get this done? Do we need any resources to you know, earn the right to have that meeting or as part of the review process? And then two quick checks, are we doing this now or is it already done? And so I'll jet through a couple of these. And the, the key and why I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here is, is this is the type of habits that the best salespeople do. This isn't just a one-off thing that they do on their biggest deals. This is a mindset and a framework that they use to make sure that every single checkbox is done so again, they don't think that they can get away with one of these key boxes and then they go for the close and they realize, hey, the right person actually hasn't seen this yet, right? We wanna avoid those last minute stop signs. And so on the left, what you're gonna see is pricing confirmed and terms confirmed. Pricing, how much are we paying for this? Who are we talking to? Do you need anything from our end? And are we in progress or is this done? Terms is similar, but that could be your you know, net 30, net 45, net 60, your payment terms. It could be anything extra added, like you're going to be a customer reference for us, or we're going to do co-marketing together, right? Whatever the terms of that contract are. Budget is different. This is making sure that, hey, if your contract costs $50,000, not only is there $50,000 in budget, but it's allocated for this decision. This project has money to back it. The earlier you do that, the better. The next one is, have we identified who the budget holder is? Who's releasing the purse strings to give you what you need to get this deal done? A lot of times that's the CFO and you might not talk to that individual till later in the sales process, or if at all. Ideally you do, because then you get to the next box, which is, you know, to me, kind of the nail in the coffin. If you can get direct contact with that budget holder, you're only gonna increase your odds because you're getting in a room air quotes over room, this happens over web conference oftentimes, but you can understand what are their holdups. You can convey the value firsthand. This is a kind of a, a bonus. I highly suggest doing it, but if you can get on the phone with the budget holder and walk through any details, it can mitigate a lot of objections that come up later. The next one is a legal review. I left a couple empty boxes because there's so many different ways and documents that you know, your product can be reviewed. But a really common one is your T's and C's, your terms and conditions. Do we need to redline anything? Are we working with the legal counsel or working with your POC, your champion to get that done? Do they need a Word doc, right? We'll get into some examples on the next slide. The last one is your security review. And I probably should have put this one first because along with legal, because these are the things that can take a lot of time, depending on the size of the organization you're selling to, how quickly they can move and review. So I highly, highly suggest getting these things started as quickly as possible. The last thing you wanna do is get a verbal from the decision maker, the economic buyer is ready to sign, but you have three weeks of security review to go through. And so the documents that you share will, will vary, but oftentimes there's a review checklist, right? The, the prospect needs to see something. or already have you fill out something, excuse me. In terms of where to start this, it, it will vary, but I do suggest right after the discovery call, if you have a concrete next step and this is a legitimate off in your pipeline, you should have this set up for that account. Start walking through it. The more check boxes you get, the better. That's how you know, once you get this thing filled out, again, depending on your, how you wanna customize it, that's how you know that, hey, I've got a deal locked and loaded and I can really forecast and commit this thing. So here's an example of one that I filled out Let's say we're working with Jenna from our uh, email example. She's our sales director. 
we're working on talking about price, as you can see in this in progress, but I need to know how many licenses she needs. So maybe that's our next step and she's gonna come back to me with that before I can say complete. Same thing with terms. From there, we'll get into terms. We haven't started that yet. We haven't done allocation yet, but I've identified the budget holder. I know for sure that it is Mark, our CRO, or their CRO. I have not gotten direct contact yet, but I'm in progress. Maybe I've asked Jenna, hey, can we get that meeting on the book? She says, yeah, let me get back to you. So I'm in progress. I'm mindful of it. I'm working on it. And it looks like I need a business case to present to him in that meeting. If we go down, we can see our point of contact is a legal counsel there. She needs our T's and C's in a Word doc. Once I send that over, it's in progress, right? And so you start to get the feel here of understanding who are the stakeholders, what do they need to get it, uh, you know, the review or the conversation started. And once you get this completely filled out, that's how you know you have a real deal on the line. All right. The next one is understanding when a deal is going to come in. And this is a map or a mutual action plan which is a document that helps the seller and prospect work together to find a mutually beneficial solution. What this does, and you'll see an example shortly that you can take home, is you don't wanna be Lewis and Clark, which is you know figuring it out for the very first time. I know where I'm at, I have a general sense of where we're going, a signature, but if you don't know all the steps in the meantime, it can be a very uncertain process. Right, and, it's, and it makes it a little more challenging for your prospect and your champion to invest more time with you because they don't know exactly how they're gonna get to their desired outcome, which is your implemented solution and the results that it brings. What you do wanna be is a GPS, guiding your client through the process with precision. And I'll dive into that a little bit more. Here are the benefits of a map. So for you, you're gonna see increased close rates because you're going to surface hurdles in the buying process early. As you walk through all of the different steps of what's uh, you know, necessary for getting this deal done, you're gonna to start to surface things like, oh, that's right, we need to do this. Oh, that's right, we should loop in so-and-so. And it's also to hold you accountable to make sure you don't miss a step in your selling motion, that you don't skip anything. Like the Lewis and Clark slide, it's gonna improve the buyer's experience because you're gonna provide a consultative guided guide through the evaluation process. When you have control over your own sales process and it reflects that as a consumer or your buyer, it reflects your professionalism and experience in your space and it helps build trust and credibility. It's gonna arm them with the confidence to go get things done on your behalf or talk to their leaders and get budget approved. And then lastly, it's gonna increase your performance consistency. Anytime that you're working through a, a map, and you see something is missed or a deadline hasn't been made, you're gonna, it serves as a forecast alert or a deal alert, saying, uh-oh, there's that speed bump. We're about to hit it or we just did. I need to focus my attention here. And then also, as you start to finish out your map, you're gonna see which accounts are closest to the finish line, and that will help you, uh, you know, guide your attention in terms of where you should focus. All right, so here is what a map looks like. It's bare bones by design because you get to fill it in. And the next slide will show you an example. So the top headers are action item, what is going to be accomplished, the due date, when is it gonna be done by, the objective, why are we doing this, and the owner. That's gonna be who is responsible for it. That could be you, that could be your prospect, it could be a mixture of both. As I said prior, you're probably going to want to start using both of these once you're at the, you know, post-discovery, you know this is a real deal, right? You don't want to just start filling out docs for every single person you talk to. You want to make sure that there's, you know, some real, uh, a real deal there. But once you do, you're going to want to start filling this out with them. And here's what an example is when you start to figure it out. So let's say you've had your discovery, maybe your demo, and they're saying, hey, we want to pilot this thing. To me, if you have a trial as part of your sales process, that's a really you know, a, a true sign that this has a chance of closing. And so if we look at our action item, first we're gonna set up the test account. You can see when the due date is, the objective is to prep for the pilot launch, and the owner is myself and my champion, Jenna, at ABC Corp. After that, 
we need to define the success criteria. Again, we have our due date. And the objective is to define success and direction for the pilot. We need to decide what, where we're headed here with our GPS. And the owner is going to be Devin, Jenna, and Mark, the CRO from the previous examples, also needs to be a part of that. Right? And so what you keep doing is you keep going through this list, filling it out. And, and what a best practice is, is to keep the next couple things filled out here. Because when you present this to them for the first time, and as you work on it with them, you want to show that, hey, I know the next couple terms. Right? You know when you're in a, uh, I don't know, new area for the first time, you're on the freeway, and you're like, okay, it says get off in 2.5 miles. But what do I do next? Do I stay in the left lane, the middle lane, the right lane? Where am I going from there? This gives you some of that confidence and some relief of, okay, I know where we're headed next. The next best practice is going to be sharing this with them. You're going to be able to download this, fill it out, and you can share this with them. I highly advise sharing it in view only mode. The reason being is you don't want them to come in here and move a due date without you knowing. And if they need to edit something, they can request edit, request edit access, and that gives you a notification that, hey, something's changed or we're making progress and they just want to add something to it. Right? So this is something you own and you are filling out, but it's a mutual action plan. They need to have visibility to it and they need to help build it and create it with you. All right, so to recap what we covered today, first, avoid the pricing conversation via email. It's okay to send your pricing model, but don't fall into the trap of negotiating via email. Two is use the green list check, uh, yet the green light checklist, excuse me, to overcome deal killers in the buying process. Make sure you understand everything that's necessary, who's involved, so you have control over your deal. And the last one is control the timing of your deal, the mutual action plan of your map. Have a great act outline of what needs to happen when, hold yourself and your prospect accountable to make sure deals are coming in on time. Now what do you do? Take what you just learned, go to market, and let me know how it goes. I would love for you to get back to me on LinkedIn. If you have any feedback of how it went, suggestions, comments, uh, always make sure to get back to you. We would love to hear how this is working out. And to get access to the next masterclass, you're going to want to make sure you're following Gong on LinkedIn. Go over to our page on LinkedIn, hit follow. Not only will you get an update when the next negotiation masterclass is, is ready, we will also get alerts for when we get um, you know, you're added to your feed when we release our video content. Some of it's really funny. A lot of it's informative. And we also have posts that come out about every two weeks, giving you tips, tricks, and insights into how you can close more deals. So that's all the time we have for today. Feel free to, again, follow us on LinkedIn. And you can also add me, Devin Reed, on LinkedIn. Until next time.